Hey, what's up? This is Todd Smith, and I am back with another video. In this video, I want to talk about Behringer and my experience with five years of Behringer synthesizers. And now, to be 100% honest, it's like four years and like eight, nine months. But we're just going to round it up to five years because you know, that makes a much better title. Now, before I go into my experience over the last five years, I need to thank Behringer for making these pieces that sound so great at such a great price tag. I made a video yesterday kind of saying I bought too many mono synths. Not Behringer's fault. I bought way too many mono synths of theirs because they sound great, amazing price tag. And you gotta appreciate when a company makes stuff so good and so cheap that you can just buy too much of it. With that being said, looking back at my first Model D purchase from Behringer almost five years ago, I had no idea the gate it was about to unlock. I absolutely fell in love with the Model D. It just hits those classic bass sounds so easily. A lot of them are kind of, you know, vanilla in a way. They ain't like out of the world, crazy, insane bass. But if you just want that classic, creamy bass, man, the Model D is just a monster. Obviously, beyond just really smooth bass lines, it can do other things. But for me, it, that's definitely where it gravitates towards. And today, it's still by far one of my most used Behringer synths and purely because it's so simple. The deeper I dive into these analog synths, I'm finding that I like the ones with a more simple layout. And the Model D really falls into that simple but great sounding synth. And that was a gateway into the Neutron. And I gotta say, when I started exploring the Neutron, I was surprised at how great the oscillators sound with absolutely no patching. When I saw it and I saw all the patch bays, I was like, oh, you're gonna have to really get going in these wires probably to get this thing sounding juicy. And that's really not the case, just alone, just the oscillators by themselves with a the filter, a nice good layer of sound, man, it sounds great. I'm guilty of not exploring the patching enough, honestly. Uh, that's, I've found, to be real with you, the deeper we dive into this, just like I said, my last um, Model D thing that I seem to like simplicity, I don't really seem to patch a lot of wires. That just, I guess, isn't my thing. So I haven't fully explored the Neutron, and that's my fault. And again, because I just don't tend to patch. But it's an amazing sounding synth, and I'm really amped to see what they do with the Protron. Many people love this device, and I feel that's 100% justified. And if you are into patching, I think this is like a must have because of all the options it brings to the table in terms of in and out and patching. I definitely need to explore that more. Definitely a great synth, and that with the Model D made me invest in the Pro One. And the Pro One was really uh, kind of a brain dead choice for me, I feel, because it is like pinnacle mono 80 synth, in my opinion. That snappy envelope, um, the filter with this, um, I, it just sounds amazing. I actually feel it sounds great with very little resonance. Lock down on that, you get a nice, solid little fast bass kind of going on it or sequence. And then when it comes to just mono pads and stuff, I mean, it can just make some. <laughs> absolutely classic 80s sounds. The Pro One is definitely a synth that's going to be staying in my studio for a pretty long time. Then you got the TD3 and the Crave. Those are two very, again, simple analog synths, the ones I tend to gravitate towards. And the Crave is great, but I really just love the TD3. I mean, that's about as simple as simple can get. And it just always seems to fit into the mix so good. And while all these other mono synths have a lot more you know, option and variety within their sound, you have to take a little while to dial in, find a sweet spot to even kind of begin with. Where the TD3 is a lot more limited, but it's gonna sound good kind of right out the gate. There isn't a lot to, you gotta do to kind of get it going. So I really love the TD3. That is something you're gonna see a lot in my setup in, re in upcoming videos, because it's just, I, I love that thing. It's good for bass beyond just the squelchy acid bass. There's something about simplicity and great sound that just make a great combination. And last but not least, the ARP 2600 from Behringer, which is actually not in my studio right now, but a month after I got it, let it over to my friend. He's still playing with it. He's kind of deciding if he wants to invest in the 2600. He was like, yeah, I've been thinking about getting one too. I just don't know. I haven't been able to touch one. I'm like, yeah, well, dude, I got way too much stuff, honestly. <laughs> I shouldn't even have bought this. I was like, you can play with this for a while. Let me do my thing. I'll rip it back from you later. Then you can decide if you want to spend your money on it. 
And even though it sounds amazing, again, that's another synth that you really need to patch to get the best out of it. It's definitely a um, space synth. You know, it can go all out of all the uh, Behringer I own. I guarantee that one can go the furthest out into space in terms of sound. So if you are a patcher, if you're a guy who likes to get in there, drop those wires in, play around for a while, the 2600 is an, probably an absolute monster. Even with just basic patching, which normally I do, I was able to dial in some sounds that sounded great right out the gate. So every single Behringer synth I've bought over the last five years, in my opinion, for the money, has been absolutely worth it. You know, it's pretty cool. It's um, We're in an amazing time, especially if you're into that pure analog stuff. What Behringer is bringing to the table is something we've never seen before in history in terms of price slash performance. And this is just the beginning, guys. I mean, they've just now started the ball rolling with these last four or five years. And I can promise you, even though I have no connection to the company, the next five years will be more intense. I've really enjoyed my five years with the Behringer since. Right now, I tend to mix them with my digital at times because I like to kind of blend in the hybrid analog digital setup. But Behringer will definitely always have its place in my setup in the future. I would love to hear your opinions on your pieces with Behringer down below. And as always, stay positive, stay creative, support each other, and peace.